welcome to uh, this studio and uh, we're talking about the project that you um, have been participating in Mission Siberia. Um, I would like to find out how initially you got interested in that project and why it was important for you to take part in that. Well, myself as a young person, I always think how I can participate in, the, uh, in my country's life. And this is one of the most successful projects in Lithuania organized by young people. So naturally, I want to take, to take part and to be part of this organization. And I was, I'm was, i very happy to be here. Also, as many young people, I always question myself. What is my role in my country? How can I work together with my friends, with my family, with everyone else in society to make this country, to make Lithuania prosperous. And Mission Siberia is one of the best ways to do that. And how come? How do you, uh, how do you find it necessary, so necessary and so important for your country? Well, basically, uh, each and every generation has different and sometimes very similar views how uh, we should work with our civic education, how we should work with our patriotism. On the other hand, uh, we, within these generational discussions, we always find some differences and some similarities. Mm -hmm. And Mission Siberia is a project that always bridges the different generations together because we speak about historical events. On the other hand, we always emphasize the importance of young people to take part in its country's life. And uh, our expeditions is only a tool that we use to approach young people and to show that our history is interesting, that our civic education is interesting and is a modern and um, popular topic to speak about because sometimes young people think that history is not important or is boring and uh, we always show the opposite. Speaking about the way you were discovering history for yourself, uh, tell me about where you went, uh, what you saw and what was the most unexpected and maybe a surprising thing for you there during these expeditions. Uh, this year I took part in the in Mission Siberia expedition to Igarka, a very small little town mm -hmm. in uh, Krasnoyarsk area in the north. Mm -hmm. And uh, some um, in 1948, uh, more than 5,000 Lithuanians were deported to Igarka, and we wanted to visit this uh, this town and to tidy up the biggest uh, Lithuanian deportee cemetery in Siberia. And the most interesting thing for me is was to find out how many how big cemetery was. It's uh, almost more than one hectare. Of the of area, and you can see dozens of crosses, and more than 500 people were buried in these cemeteries. And when you walk around, you feel uh, very interested, and then you understand that you are 5,000 kilometers away from Lithuania, and you see dozens of Lithuanians' names, surnames, and even when you meet locals, you you meet people with Lithuanian names, Lithuanian. Uh, surnames and everyone knows Lithuania there so it's always interesting to see that you're somewhere more or less in the middle of nowhere and you feel feel uh, that connection there. So talking to people uh, who were sent to Siberia uh, who stayed there and their you know their children I guess their grandchildren at this point did it change your uh, perspective on uh, the whole history of deportations and the aftermath of the deportations? Yeah, in many cases we, uh, uh, I think in each and every country, we always focus on our own history in Lithuania, in Russia or whatsoever. And, uh, uh, but it's very important to see a broader perspective that it's uh, deportations touched each and every country, uh, no matter where it was, because this is a question uh, that uh, always is important to to each and every country and what we saw there is that there there were lots of deportees from different kind of origin you know Lithuanians Polish Germans and that's that's important always to emphasize that this is a question that uh, should unite us and that we all together should think and reflect about the history that happened and uh, just talking about personal histories of the people there um, there are different it's not black and white 
uh, people who went there, uh, they, uh, some of them returned to Lithuania, some of them returned to Lithuania and then went back to Siberia. Um, I just wanted to hear about your, um, your experience with these stories. What was the most, I guess, unexpected for you as well? to find out the most touching and how did you see the line, uh, the lifelines of those people developing from, you know, from the moment of deportation onwards? Well, each and every story is always unique and always very emotional. And when we traveled to Garka, we knew that almost more than 5,000 people were there. Most of them uh, returned back to Lithuania and we can see, we can uh, meet more people from Igarka in Lithuania than actually in Igarka itself. Mm -hmm. Yet we still met uh, some of people f with Lithuanian origin in Igarka, uh, Lithuanian deportees or sons and daughters of Lithuanian deportees. And it's always very touching when you uh, meet people who live so far away from Lithuania, but they know their roots. They know that, for example, we met Victoria in, in Igarka and she, her father was Lithuanian. And uh, she never went to Lithuania and most probably she never will be because it's a very, very far away mm -hmm. uh, distance. But still, she knows that her father was Lithuanian. She knows some, um, some language and she knows the history. And uh, she speaks Russian. She is completely integrated in, 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 the, in, the, in the society. No matter the fact, she still finds a lot of place in her heart for Lithuania and for the history that happened. And it's always very touching to uh, meet these people who, uh, when you suddenly meet someone with a Lithuanian name, Lithuanian surname, and you immediately find a connection. And then we invited her to the cemeteries that we tidied up, and it was a very emotional moment when we see the unity that unites us as, as a community. Uh, just uh, talking about history and how it is perceived uh, in different countries, um, I know that in many cases um, there were some forbidden, let's say, topics. And uh, deportation was not a forbidden topic, but um, in many countries from where people were sent to Siberia, uh, there were, say, various interpretations of uh, how these people went and when they came back. What did you find out for yourself in terms of, you know, this official line of history and the official line of narrative of how these people lives were, you know, forming after their deportation? Well, there are many interpretations, as you said, about the history. Uh, on the other hand, this one of the main fundamental values of this project is that we see and create history ourselves. It means that we go to these uh, distant areas, we analyze archives, we uh, meet with people ourselves as young people, and we always try to experience it ourselves. And uh, it's, uh, as you said, it's not always black and white. And there are many, many different stories. But, and what is important for us is to bring, back, bring them up to the daylight, to, to show these, these stories, to show not you know, the facts that are already known, the facts that you know, mo most of us agree upon, but we emphasize on these uh, particular interesting emotional stories that uh, uh, fulfill the, ho the overall picture. And these, these stories, there are numerous of them. We visited, uh, you know, we had 15 expeditions to various uh, areas of Siberia. So there are lots of different stories, lots of different backgrounds, uh, and not only for Lithuanians, for many, many kind of uh, deportees and, uh, or children of deportees. And it's always interesting to see that, you know, this, uh, the history is very tragic. On the other hand, uh, uh, you can find uh, lots of connections uh, throughout the history. Um, how did this uh, project change your perspective compared to what you were taught at school, for instance? I'm sure there was history that was, you know, the narrative uh, that you were given as a, as a young person. And then you started doing, you started seeking this alternative history yourself. So how did it change your perspective? Well, it kind of... Uh, complemented already what uh, what was taught in school. Uh, in school we do a certain analysis of hi different various historic events, especially the ones that happened in 20th century. On the other hand, uh, sometimes uh, the textbooks cannot show you the uh, the hu hu the emotion, the uh, humans behind that, because you can see numbers, you know, how many thousand of 
people were deported, were killed, were imprisoned. But when you bring back, bring up one or two stories, that's mu sometimes it's even more important because then pe people can feel the connection. Because sometimes for us, for young people, these events that happened 70 years ago, we did not participate in that. We did not even see the, uh, you know, the Soviet Union's regime. And for us, it's in, it's sometimes it's hard to understand what happened in the, during these times. So then we start to feel that ourselves and it didn't change my perspective of history it kind of deepened that because I already knew the facts I already knew all the information that was coming from the school but all of this when you feel that yourself when you touch the history yourself that uh, broadens your mind very very much and then you understand that history is not about numbers history is about uh, stories of people around us uh, when, uh, when I was reading about the project, uh, one of the missions uh, was stated as bridging the gap between generational gap in your country. So I just wanted to find out how you think uh, your perception of these events is different from the perception of, say, your uh, parents and how, um, how are you trying to bridge the gap with what you do? It's always um, the understanding of history is different when you are uh, participating in these historical mm -hmm. events yourself and when you observe that or when you learn about these kind of things. We as a generation of independence, we were raised and brought in an independent country mm -hmm. with f of all you know rights and possibilities to express ourselves. In that case, you know when our parents tell us about these uh, things that happened, we might, uh, amp we might uh, connect ourselves in, in some cases, in some cases we cannot. And, uh, uh, you know, our parents were part of the independence movement and they, uh, they have one perception of, of civic education, of, of uh, how you love your country. We as a modern, a new generation, we have the same values, but tools are different. You know, we mm -hmm. live in the world of social media. We live in world of communication. We w live in the world in different kind of world than it was 30 or 50 years ago. And even though the values are the same, the means and tools are different. And that's what we always stress with our project, that we agree upon uh, fundamental values each and every generation. But, you know, things that were working 70 or 50 or 20 years ago are not working anymore in some cases. You know, when you, you can be patriotic and you can be civic-minded via Facebook or, or, or Instagram. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing bad about that. And we always, uh, we as a project always try to bridge these generational differences that, you know, for our grandparents, maybe Facebook is not the most important tool of communication. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they might criticize that young people are always on, I on the internet, on the computers, on smartphones. And we always said that that's not a problem because these can be a tools that we can use. And that's, I think, what we always do with our project is to try to connect these generations when try to bring these stories from our parents and grandparents and connect them with, uh, with the minds of young people. Because sometimes it's hard for them to sit down on one table and have a talk. And we always, uh, we try to be these, this mediator in between. Do you feel there is a difference in perception though? Or uh, the storyline is pretty much the same and the platforms are different? Uh, the storyline is the same. The platforms are different. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, all of us agree uh, upon uh, fundamental values that we share. The value of independence, the value of liberty, the value of our history. But uh, we look for different tools and we look for different platforms to show that. And we as a project try to uh, work with each and every generation. We don't focus only on young people. We also focus on, for example, the deportees themselves because deportees themselves might find it difficult to approach young people and to, to tell these amazing stories. So that's why we come here and we ma manage, I, I think, we manage to connect these two generations or, or even three generations to understand that we are basically working for the same goal. But tools may be different and that's very natural because maybe in 20 or 15 years, um, new generation will come and say, well, no, Facebook is not working anymore. We have to do something else. And that's, and that's why we have to keep up uh, with the um, modernization and, and with the changing world ourselves because history is there, but we have to find out the ways how to uh, make history interesting and up-to-date.
Uh, when you traveled to Russia, you went to so many places. Uh, did you get to find out or meet people uh, from Russia who are involved in uh, similar projects in, you know, finding out um, alternative ways to talk about history or to help people understand better? Well, we mo mostly we focus on uh, on uh, the aims of our own project uh, that we go to distant areas in Siberia to tidy up the cemeteries and go back f to make presentations. On the other hand, we have certain connections with, uh, uh, for example, we tidied up the Butovsky Polygon uh, near Moscow and we also showed our uh, solidarity with victims of, of totalitarian regime in Russia, which is also a, an example from our side that, you know, we uh, that history is important in e each and every country to understand that. And uh, we, ha uh, we more or less focus on our own stories, on our own history. On the other hand, we manage to, for example, tidy up uh, the cemeteries of Jews here in Lithuania or other kind of uh, minorities, ethnical groups, in order to show solidarity with everyone, to, so to show solidarity with, uh, with the society in a broad way. Um, if you talk about what you have already achieved and what uh, your plans uh, in the future are, can you tell me what you've, you've done so far, the highlights, and again, what you're planning to do, what are you planning to achieve in the near future? Uh, project started in 2005. It means that we already are working for 11 years. We, throughout the 11 years, we organized 15 expeditions mm -hmm. to Siberia. More than 11,000 people applied to take part. Uh, because we have an open application process and anyone can participate. So we had more than 11,000 people wanting to take part, and which is, a, in my opinion, a big number for a three million nation. And we uh, had 15 expeditions. We created nine documentary movies that were broadcasted on national television. Uh, we, this year, we have all, almost planned more than three, we have uh, planned more than 300 presentations in Lithuania and abroad where people are inviting us to tell the stories that we do. Uh, and we are planning to do the photo exhibition. We are cre already creating the next documentary movie about our expedition. The plans are to keep up the work that we do. Uh, we are all already planning next year's expedition. And of course, we have lots of different plans for 2018. But as I said, expedition is only a tool. The aim is to show that you know young people are civic-minded, young people are civic-oriented and that we, uh, that history is interesting and that's the main uh, goal that we want to achieve and we're already achieving and we will find out what kind of tools uh, are they going to be. Right now we have expeditions, maybe after 10 or 5 years we will find out something more interesting, but right now when we have, this year we had 811 applications for 16 places in, 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 uh, in expeditions. So, this shows that the project is still interesting and we will still continue to do that in, in various forms. But the main thing, th it r remains the same, to, to show that young people are civic minded. Thank you so much. I wish you very good luck with all your Thank projects. You and uh, we'll be hearing, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about you and hopefully from you here in Washington or anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you very much.